Welcome to Liz McMullen Show Retrospective Series, where we get to talk about our writer's entire body of work. Uh, my second guest in the series is Carilla Steps Waters. Thank you so much for lending your time and your beautiful body of work for the show. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> so, um, as I was going through your stuff, you have five books in print right now? That's right. Okay. Um, the first two are... Um, Sapphire has them and it's the admirer and the purveyor and one of the things that I know from you because you you teach writing is that you changed course a bit like the first book that you wrote um, your um, what do they call it your agent couldn't sell it like it was beautifully written but it was missing plot and, and whatnot to get people's hearts beating and, and um, drawn into it so it was semi-biographical, um, and then you go completely on the other end of the spectrum for this thriller, The Admirer, that is so dark and, and twisted. And I'm like, I know you as a person. I was like, I just can't even imagine how this came out of her head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's so different. Like, what, like, how did it feel for you writing that type of work, and why that? Because I know that you were seeking to um, not necessarily write for a market, but just kind of change your writing a little bit, and that's just a really big bump. Like, what drew you in that direction? So I had written these two very sweet books, one memoir, one novel, um, just absolutely clean. You could give this to a five-year-old child. You could give it to your conservative grandmother. Um, they were, in some ways, probably showed a little bit of potential, but the, they were basically very dull novels uh, or novel and memoir. So I decided that I was I was missing sex and violence, uh, and I was going to I wanted to be published. I decided a, the thriller genre was going to be my my first attempt, so I studied thrillers for about a year, read them, um, critiqued them, took them apart, and then I set about to write a thriller with as much sex and violence as I could possibly pack in there because I, I believe in fulfilling your goals. If you're going to do it, commit to it and go all the way. And luckily, I had a really good writing group at the time that saved me from myself because I went way too far, way overboard. Um, I really didn't, you know, I, I was like a, a painter who didn't know their tools yet. Uh, so I, I put in way too much. Uh, and they helped me rein it back to what I think is uh, an exciting but classy level of sex and violence, which you'll find in The Admirer and in the sequel, The Purveyor. Uh, and uh, I actually initially wrote those books with a mainstream audience in mind, um, although they ended up finding a home at Sapphire Books, which is a lesbian publisher, and proving that I really don't know what I'm doing, although I try very hard to figure it out. Uh, the uh, later book that I wrote with a specifically lesbian audience in mind, in fact, I had actually looked at the mission statements of a bunch of lesbian presses to kind of eyeball what they were looking for and then write specifically to that audience. That book ended up being the one that got picked up by the mainstream publishing house. So, uh, proof is that I can try really hard and still not really understand uh, the, the ever changing. Uh, tides of publishing. So is this something true or you're talking about, forgive me if I told you this before. Something true was the lesbian romance that I wrote by lesbians, for lesbians, about lesbians. And of course that's the one that the, the straight market picked up and loved. It's such an interesting book, especially, um, something true is the, is the title. Um, especially because the, classy, uh, sexy uh, businesswoman is described as a younger Hillary Clinton. And I wanted to ask, <laughs> is like, do you think Hillary Clinton is hot? Um, or like, what? how did that come up as a descriptor, as something that you wanted to put into people's minds? And, and given that, let me just open the book a second. I'll look at the, where's the little publishing farm? You put this out in 2014, so this is long before the morass that we found ourselves in uh, with our first woman president <laughs> that never was. <laughs> the, the question of Hillary Clinton's attractiveness is, I think, at the center of 
everything that I think about when I think about writing romance novels, and that's the issue of power. I was at a coffee shop or a restaurant the other day uh, with one of my straight male friends, and he said to me, uh, as we were leaving the restaurant, he said, oh my gosh, did you see the waitress? And I was like, no, what waitress? And he's like, I cannot believe that you did not notice that the waitress was the most gorgeous woman alive. And I was like, dude, she was 22. Like, at 22, I might have thought she was beautiful, but uh, now at 40, um, not so much. He still did think she was gorgeous. I said, you know, for me, the attractiveness of a woman is entirely wrapped up in her power. It is not about, you know, the perfect figure or the long, shiny hair. It's about how much personal power she wields. And I think uh, that really comes into play in romance novels because you'll see a lot of romance novels where the uh, kind of weak female is attracted to the strong alpha male. And the strong alpha male, these are straight romances, of course, mm-hmm. is attracted to the beautiful, fragile, delicate, but maybe with a spark of independence woman. Uh, you see that in Fifty Shades of Grey. And I actually, I, I set about to rip off Fifty Shades of Grey. I thought, you know, I'll read it, I'll analyze it, and then I'll write a well-written lesbian version. Um, but when I was set about to do that, I could not figure out a situation in which a very strong, powerful woman would be attracted to a very powerless, meek, kind of dull, helpless female uh, on the other side. And so I think, um, you know, is Hillary Clinton attractive? She was less attractive after she lost the election, I can tell you that. Um, As a politician, she has a certain amount of power, but in my mind, never had enough to be really charismatically attractive. Uh, But so in the, in something true, when the character says, well, she's like a younger Hillary Clinton, it's a bit of a dig, but it's a bit of a compliment too, because, because uh, it is addressing that issue of power. And in that romance novel, and also in my second one, For Good, uh, you have a dynamic where both women are very powerful in one particular aspect of their life, and that's what the, their lover is drawn to. And, of course, there's also areas in their life where they are weaker or fragile, and those are also a source of the, the love and the tenderness that, that come later on in the story as the characters move from that initial attraction to a deeper affection for each other. Yeah, I really like uh, your use of language in, in your books, and so I have a bunch of different little snippets here and there um, that just tickle me. One of them that I, I noticed going throughout something true, this isn't a quote, I, I have a quote a little further than in there, Um, but I felt like in some ways I was reading Moonstruck, not because of the plot perchance, but there were a lot of, um, you know, did I write that one down? Um, let's see. Of course I didn't write it down, but anyway, it was like, you know, that, 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 that she was being with her, being with, um, her was like, you know, drinking a bowl of moonlight or moon, like there's like moonlight and stars and moons everywhere throughout the book. And it's like, is that on purpose? Did she have a lot of moon action going on? And, you know, I was just wondering if that was an accidental thing that you didn't realize was popping up in the book over and over again. Oh, I think almost all the metaphors and symbolism and imagery that, that occurs multiple times in, in my writing is, is organic. I've never sat down and thought, you know, I'm going to use a metaphor now. Let's see, what would be a good metaphor for this character? Well, what's an image I could put in, you know, throughout the book? That that has never happened to me. Uh, but I do feel like each story has a kind of um, or a naturally occurring set of images and ideas and, and feelings that do very naturally bubble up uh, so that, yeah, in that story, um, something true it starts with the description of portland twilight so you know june when it stays light until almost 10 o'clock and the city's kind of magical and you get that blend of moonlight and and street light and the the daylight and those images appear throughout the book even though i 
didn't think that. Never intended it. It wasn't, it wasn't on purpose. I actually did write your first sentence down. It was late June, the kind of warm summer evening when happy, when hopeless romantics make bad decisions about beautiful women. And I was like, that's a really great first line. It's got whimsy. It tells you a sense of place. And, you know, you know that you're launching into um, a romance novel from the perspective of, you know, what some would describe as a hopeless romantic. See, so sweet. Um, One of the things that I thought was really funny, because you have some great unusual characters in your books, and and one of them uh, is Maggie, who's the owner of Out out in Portland Coffee. And um, this is the quote, Kind-hearted Maggie, something happened in utero, and she had been born without the ability to understand sarcasm. Which I thought was epic. <laughs> in that, in something true, uh, I, like I said, I was really trying to write it for lesbians, by lesbian, of course, and about the lesbian community. And I see the book as it's a love story about two women, but it's also my love song for the lesbian community and for Portland as well. Uh, and Maggie represents the baby boomer generation lesbian, uh, the feminist of the 60s and 70s, who gave, you know, who made a place for people like me in the world. So, you know, uh, she's sometimes a little too earnest and also a little bit more optimistic than the Tate, the 30-something lesbian who doesn't really have the kind of faith in activism and community building that Maggie does. But, um, yeah, Maggie is, so she's a little earnest. She's a little comic in that, but she's also this wonderful mother figure who has protected Tate and protected the lesbian community. And, and I have a great deal of love for that era in my life and a great deal of appreciation for you know, what they've made possible for me. Uh, and then in Something True, Tate also has a young woman she's mentoring who is kind of the new generation of, of lesbian or maybe we should say queer kids because more she's and like, more... She's like, is it like uh, in the movies? Yes, it's about, like in the movies. <laughs> lesbian, straight, binary. Um, so I found the quote. It swall- swallowed a bowl from full of warm moonlight. I'm like, hmm. What does warm moonlight taste like? (laughs) Um, One thing that stuck in my head about this, you know, about a meeting where they're essentially finding out, it's only supposed to be a perfunctory meeting where the people are being told, you know, in this case, out coffee, that, you know, they're going to be out of a building and out of work and, you know, community relations and stuff like that. One of the things I found was really fascinating um, was... uh, uh, Laura, that's her name, right? Laura? <laughs> Laura was able to silence the two other men by just lifting two fingers slightly off of the pen that she she had been holding. And I'm like, that's so cool. And then Tate thinks to herself, um, what kind of lesbian feminist uh, met the corporate overlord and thought, I'd like a piece of that? <laughs> And again, you have the power of the two women. Laura is very powerful in the world of business, and that is attractive to Tate. But Laura is also closeted and has kind of subjugated her own life and desires to the desires of her uh, wealthy conservative politician father. So she looks at Tate and sees Tate's, uh, the fact that Tate is out, the fact that Tate lives on her own terms, the fact that Tate uh, is very much her own woman. She sees the power in that and is drawn to it. So I think they make a nice balance for each other. I felt like the book in some ways was also a love story about Portland. Absolutely. I wrote it a year or two, or started it a year or two, after I left Portland. And I lived in Portland in probably what was Portland's best years. Uh, It was still affordable, um, still safe, still small, but also a city that was very much up and coming. So there was a new venue and a new bar and a new coffee shop and a new band. Every day, every night. Um, But you could still rent a nice two-bedroom townhouse for $550 a month. So it was kind of the best of 
of everything that Portland has been, both quirky and weird. A series that I'm writing is called Out in Portland. And I want it to be set in my Portland, Portland of the early 2000s, forever. I don't want Portland to change uh, in the stories. And I think that's okay. People enjoy the fantasy of romance, and they don't necessarily need to know about the traumas of urban planning in their Portland-based romance. But I do, as I write, you know, remember some of the struggles that Portland's going through now and, and uh, always have to ask myself, well, I'm going to put that in or not. I'm going to deal with those issues or not. But, oh, Portland in the early 2000s was just the most magical city. It was, it was perfect. I'm going to draw us back to <laughs> your, your, it's so hilarious because in one book you have goths in there and they're teenagers and, you know, with the dark clothing and affect and whatnot. But uh, the, the first two books aren't decidedly gothic, but would appeal. Like, I could, I could almost see the characters, and forgive me if I've told you this before, I could see the, Trinu and whatnot reading the admirer and the purveyor. I could, I could see them, like, darkly enjoying that particular thing. One thing that tickles me, actually, and I think about it, is because you've mentioned it um, both in classroom and other settings, is your elevator speech for um, the description of the admirer is so epic, especially coming from, you know, you're, you're such a sweet, <laughs> earnest-looking woman. And so when those words come out of your mouth, it's kind of like when my mom curses, you just don't expect it because she looks so darn sweet. So if you could lay it on my uh, listeners, what your description, your elevator speech as to what the admirer is about. Uh, the Admirer is about a serial killer with an amputee fetch. <laughs> and I had a friend, when I first started writing, well, not writing, when I was first published, um, folks at the college where I teach would ask me what, you know, they, oh, I heard you published a book, what's it about? And uh, I would tell them, and I remember being at one of the local pubs, and my friend Scott is sitting next to me in some well-meaning fellow professor comes over and asks, and I'd say, well, it's about a serial killer with an amputee fetish, and our colleague just kind of smiles awkwardly and walks away, and Scott leans over, and he's like, I will never get tired of hearing you tell people what that book is about. <laughs> I know, that's so why I had to, I had to bring it up, I had to, I had to. You know, what's, what's interesting is, um, I, I've been reading your books and I also was rereading, re uh, Deborah Harkness's, um, All Souls trilogy. And, uh, Matthew is a character in her series and he is a vampire. Uh, he also has a habit of, you know, punishing himself, you know, not, not in the, you know, Monty Python flogging yourself kind of way, but you know, that constant, um, unkindness uh, to themselves. And I felt that Helen in The Admirer, it took her a little while to figure out that um, her perfunctory um, sexual liaisons with men uh, were her way of punishing herself. The Admirer is, you know, all, all joking aside, very much a discussion of the treatment of the mentally ill um, who gets classified as mentally ill who doesn't uh, and how we treat those people and so Helen the protagonist who's from the very beginning of the novel having visions of her sister's suicide um, is struggling with that because on the outside she's very competent and she's very capable but on the inside she's She's struggling profoundly. She's hallucinating, um, and she's racked with guilt over her sister's death. But she also, her sister was schizophrenic, and she saw how cruelly the medical system and even herself, Helen, treated her sister. Uh, and so she's very fearful of being classed as mentally ill because she sees how much uh, people suffer when that label gets attached to them. And those themes run throughout the, the whole story. There's the abandoned mental asylum. There's the the man whose father uh, ran the mental asylum uh, that is now defunct. There's the killer who's very 
troubled and whose uh, pathology is very wrapped up in the history of the asylum. So, um, and then there's the the homeless woman who is apparently who believes she can see the future and is to all outside observers completely crazy. But if you, uh, as I hope readers do read the book carefully, they'll see that, um, this homeless fortune teller actually sees the truth. So even though all of society has classed her as, as mentally ill, crazy, insane, uh, she actually tells the truth and sees the truth when other people can't. So it's really a treatment of um, the complexity of that term, mentally ill, um, and also a condemnation of how cruelly our society has treated the mentally ill and continues to on occasion. She was a, a, a Cassandra-like character from uh, Greek mythology, where she was, in Greek mythology, Cassandra was given the ability to see the future, but um, at the same time, she was also cursed with nobody taking her seriously, uh, like in, in her thoughts seriously. I think Adair is an, uh, the romantic foil for this one. Adair, she has her own... <sighs> her, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call what she has, um, mental illness, but she has a very unique way of seeing the world. And she was also brought up in a very unusual environment. She comes from an, an obscene amount of money. Um, and she's able to be, you know, strong. She's a drama, um, professor and she's able to put forward this really great robust self. But when she feels, um, things have gone poorly, then her brothers will take her in, um, and, you know, support her up and help her feel, um, good again. Randomly, this is absolutely nothing to do with the, um, the actual plot, but I was thinking about her makeup at some time where she just put, um, lipstick down the center of her mouth. And it made me think of Princess Amidala from, uh, the Star Wars series. I think that was the image. I haven't actually seen that Star Wars series. The images are so iconic. I think that that was the inspiration for that image. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I ever saw the entire film, but I kept on thinking because Adair is, you know, one of the ways that Helen describes her is when somebody who's quite beautiful tries intentionally not to appear beautiful. Like she shaves her head in a very severe fashion, the clothing that she wears. Um, but no matter what she does, she still has this level of runway beauty. And also, I guess what was built in the foundation of being like the princess growing up in the environment that she did, but she's, I, I think in a, in many of your books, it's the perception that the character has of themselves is not a true image of who they are. Yeah. Like how, that, go ahead. And that's definitely a theme that is I, I find interesting again and again. The book that I'm working on right now is a romance novel uh, between a reality television star and a woman who owns a hardware store. And they were high school friends, almost sweethearts, but not quite. And one of the themes that comes up again and again in the in that new novel is that the hardware store owner is really phenomenally beautiful. Uh, just kind of a classic genderless runway style beauty which she has no idea she doesn't she's not aware of it uh, it's not important in the world she lives in uh, whereas the television star has been chosen for her her spot not because she's particularly pretty but because she's actually not that pretty she's every woman she's you know, the producer thinks, you know, well, Midwestern housewives will be able to imagine themselves in her position because she's just kind of fine looking, normal, everyday woman. Um, and so there's this kind of clash or disconnect, um, where the star is actually, and is quite aware of the fact that she is not that beautiful and the, the hardware store owner has no idea, but the producer of the television show is, is, sees it in her and other people do as well. So I, 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 I do find that fascinating, how we see ourselves and how others see us. And I also like that in the romance novels because, you know, if you take, um, if you tell the story from two different perspectives, I usually 
use third person narration, but it's always third person through the eyes of either one or the other of the love interests in the story. Mm -hmm. And that allows me to show the reader what the character thinks and then what the person who's attracted to them thinks about them. And I think in there is some very beautiful and very poignant moments where we see love come, you know, flower uh, in, in the eyes of the person who's looking at their, their love object or their, their, their beloved, their, their special person. When, you know, when Helen considers her life, which is, as you read through, you see how the road that she went was very rough um, and required a lot of her just to kind of, like, she survived her childhood. She's like the opposite of, like, a princess that was um, protected from all the darker sides of life. Because we we have these two characters in both the admirer and the purveyor. Um, And through Helen's eyes, Adair could never truly be interested in her because she was too, you know, too beautiful, too wealthy, too popular, too effervescent, all these different things that she, that Helen must be, you know, an interesting pastime that will pass. And no matter what Adair says to her, she can't hear anything other than that personal inner soundtrack. And for Adair, when she says that, you know, why do I always fall for people who will not love me back? It almost seems like, is she being melodramatic? Is this her true way of seeing herself? And But it, it's the actual truth. It's like she falls in love with people who won't return it to her. And Helen just can't form that in her brain as reality because what she sees is this, you know, stunning, charismatic, you know, everything that you could say, like, you know, positive about, and, and they just don't see each other in the same way. And Helen's always kind of negating uh, their relationship in some sense that eventually, you know, Dare will move on. And then in the second book, they, you have a character that kind of tests that notion, who really does believe that like wealth and power, everything and Helen is nothing and and whatnot. So you get to kind of see that play out, you know, first as, you know, just insecurities in some ways in the admire and then in the purveyor. Um, it comes to full lighted glory, so to speak. And I, I, I love the purveyor. I think of all my books, it is probably, and no one writers aren't supposed to say this, it is probably sold the least. Um, and I can see why it's a huge book and it's an anguish book. Um, but in many ways it's my favorite of everything I've written. And I love the contrast of the two books together so that in the admirer, Helen thinks that Adair won't like her, won't fall in love with her because Adair is, I love the use, your word effervescent, uh, Adair is so effervescent and also Helen doesn't want to have an affair with the younger woman, doesn't want to be with uh, her subordinate at the school, this woman who is basically her employee, you know, there are all these reasons why she refuses Adair's love. Um, and then in the purveyor, she is tested. Helen is tested for, uh, don't try to even remember now, 370 pages of, in which she must prove to herself and to Adair and to the world uh, how much she loves Adair, you know, that she... She puts everything on the line for her, her career, her safety, um, her past, her present, her future, everything she is, she sacrifices uh, for a dare. And I love that, um, that compliment. Uh, and I, even though in some ways the purveyor is a very, uh, up until the happy ending, a very troubled book, anguished book. Um, I think there is a great deal of wish fulfillment for me in that Helen's, Helen's journey in that story, because I guess I'd like everyone, myself included, to have a chance to prove our love. Mm. And if we have, or maybe I should just speak for myself, if I have ever not loved enough, I hope that life will give me an opportunity to to redeem myself and to show that love. Um, our everyday lives don't always give us uh, opportunities to 
I was getting bullet to, to prove love in this powerful, visceral way. So I really like that about that, the purveyor, that uh, even when it is, it is dark and Helen is struggling, it, there's some profound wish fulfillment there for me in that uh, chance to show true love. And if you, if you think about Helen's history and how like, she had to hold so tightly onto control, in order to maintain her own personal sanity and to excel in a lot of ways, like she paired off parts of herself, the emotional parts of herself so much so that she's not necessarily in a numb fugue state, but you know, it's, she's not, she's surviving her whole life. She was surviving and clung through. And even after her um, sister passed, it still was, clawing her down and she's just trying to tread water and she has no place for anything that would give the look of impropriety um, that would unravel her sense of power. But I don't think that if she, if she hadn't experienced uh, her, her life the way that it was, I don't th think that she would imagine the career that she's taken on because there's some people who what a, whatever career path that they're in, that is their joyful place. That's what they wanted. So it's it's hard to see a character decide to kind of cast it aside all for love. Um, not that love isn't wonderful, but it seems that the second book shows you shows Helen gives Helen an opportunity to call out her own values and to decide what she feels is important and what isn't. You know and. And that's a, a journey of her own. And I feel that um, in, even though she was um, sticking her neck out and showing her love and expressing her love and supporting and whatnot, um, I think that she was also discovering a love of self in a way that she did she could have never imagined before a dare before she was, you know, shoved out of her comfort zone in a very different way than she was shoved out of a comfort zone with her sister and her family. I think that's a really good point that sacrificing everything for love, if it is truly and only about the other person, it leaves us feeling kind of uncomfortable because that's subject the self to another, uh, which isn't really a happy ending. So I think you're really right in that story that her making, Helen's making sacrifices for it there. Is also she is also coming into her own and claiming what she really wants and who she really is. Uh, I think that's a, a excellent point. Yeah, I, I liked that because everything she thought mattered, like Patrick, her her um, personal assistant extraordinaire, is is trying to hold things together as she you know seeks out a and kind of is trying to figure things out. And for him, he he loves them both. You know, Patrick, you know, is a good friend of Adair, is very close. Um, and he's trying to hold it together at the college, but she no longer has the same. It's like her 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 true north or her center has changed. And so, what was extremely important to her, like proving that um, she's capable and able and professional and can turn around this school. Um, you know, and, and the endowments and the alumni and whatnot that she, she, that was important to her, but then she realized that that was almost a mirage in a sense. And she does come back, um, to work at, at the college, but she's a different person and her values are very, very different. And, um, Adair is different as well. Uh, they, there's like a kind of a bookend between the first book and the second um, is that in the first book, Adair helps Helen forget. Sometimes she just needs to forget all the things that she has emblazoned in her mind from responsibilities to also, you know, seeing her, her, her sister take her own life. And then, and then in towards the end of the purveyor, um, it's a gift that Helen gives to Adair when Adair needs to forget. And it's a, it's a very, I know it's unintentional because you don't like sit down plotting all these wonderful little zingers, but I thought that was a very interesting way to close out a two book, um, series. 
Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate that. And while it's true, I did sit around and like plan it. I do think of the two books as very like beautifully complementary in a lot of different ways. They are almost like a mirror images of each other. If you have the Rorschach ink blot where, you know, you put the ink on the paper and you fold it in half and then you have the two kind of mirror images on the page. I think of those two books like that, that in the one hand, they're very different uh, in terms of plot in events, but a lot of the themes are similar and also the two characters trade places in a way. So Adair is trying to win Helen's love in The Admirer, and Helen is trying to prove her love or win Adair's love back in The Purveyor, and a lot of other um, similarities like that. So uh, I, I think of those two as very, you know, they fulfill my desire for symmetry. I'm quite linear. I like things neat and tidy. Uh, <laughs> of course, writing is not always neat and tidy, but I do, I do love that. Um, that symmetry in those two books definitely and and one of the, the other things thematically that happens between the two books is how love is twisted whether it's um, familial love or parental love or you know not just twisted but um abused you know like your father's not supposed to beat the crap out of you while your mom's serving cocktails upstairs which is something that happens um, to the killer in, in the first book. Um, and Adair has an interesting relationship to her uh, brother's wife. And there's just this, it's like such a twisted, warped version of love. And, and, and how that kind of plays out towards the end. It's a very dark ending you know but it, it's very thriller-esque you know helicopter pad and you know i think it was at the top of las vegas and you know lives were at stake and you know the unexpected sharpshooter comes in for the rescue <laughs> it's quite unusual the weird thing and i like i wish i i can't say it because it's a spoiler um but it seems as you tie the plot out at the end of the purveyor, it ties a lot of nuts, you know, you know, tidies things out for, yes, this may not be the love that you would have imagined, or maybe as you were reading the book, you thought it was kind of twisted um, in the purveyor, but it seems like there are quite a few people who had unexpected happily ever afters. <laughs> Yes, and uh, I suppose it is a spoiler to explain that love, but um, speaking in general terms, the purveyor is it's a, it's a chase. It's, a, it's an enormous chase scene. Um, Adair is looking for this, these beautiful conjoined twins who she has recruited to come to her college uh, and kind of save them from a cultish community uh, where they live without um, without really any education, any experience of the outer world, any medical treatment. Uh, so she is, sees herself as sort of rescuing them from this, this reclusive uh, life and bringing them to college uh, and then they're abducted. And, and so was, she thinks like it's her fault and she goes after them and Helen goes after her. Also, it was, um, at, it was at Helen's behest. Like she, it was, yes. Or so and it wasn't, it wasn't even Helen's idea. I'm, I'm forgetting the name of her sister-in-law. What is her name again? Selena. Selena. Yes. Uh, no, Cecilia. Cecilia. Okay. Cecilia. I can't believe I forgot that. Yeah, Cecilia. I was like, hold on. Um, Zelina, it sounds like Zelina, who's like one of the, um, she's uh, the Wicked Witch in... Um, once Upon a Time, which is a series uh, that takes all these different, um, you know, fairy tales and puts them on their end. So I was like, yeah, it's Lena. No, that's not correct. Right? Lena. No, no, that's not. One of the things I wanted to make sure to do in The Purveyor was to make sure that the conjoined twins um, did not become simply a, a device that they had uh, souls and personality and a life of their own. Um because it's easy to take characters like that whose physical existence is so notably different and objectify them. I mean, I think we do that to anyone who's 
physically different, whether it's more beautiful or less beautiful to to this, to that, you know, we, we attach two to everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a right way to be. And then everybody ends up being a somehow a deviation of the normal. Um, and the farther out we get from what society considers normal, the more likely it is that person is charactered and their real experience is not valued. So it was really important to me. And that's why I chose to include, uh, the first person narration from one of the twins perspective. Um, even though as a kind of linear and slightly anal, uh, writer, the idea of having a book that was partly in first person and partly in third just made my skin crawl because that's not, um, that's not symmetrical. It's not like, it's not all, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's made, skewed my fork on the napkin and now it's crooked and now I can't sleep right. Um, but, uh, but I still, I, I, I went with that even though it's not something that I'm really entirely comfortable with. And I do think it works in this book, but I wanted to give that first person voice to one of the twins to be really clear that they didn't just become objects or freak shows that were like, Oh, that's so weird. They two heads on one body. Wow. Um, that we, we actually, as the readers actually see the souls of those women, or at least a good look into one of those two women's experience. And the ending, um, hopefully won't give away too much if I say this, uh, the goal that Adair and Helen have been working towards so hard for the whole, uh, the whole book is in some ways thwarted by the twins themselves. So the people they are trying to rescue ultimately don't want that. Well, you know, they're just sex self actualized and with a different happily ever after design by, you know, what works for them. We're coming uh, to close our time together, and I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to thrust all these different quotes at you. You don't actually have to <laughs> comment on all of them, but I did. You know, I, I really love your use of language. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna read a few of the different quotes that stuck out to me. Um, so let's, <laughs> this one made me giggle. This is this is um, forgive me if I told you this before, and, and it's your book, the one book from Ulligan Press, and. Um, the quote is Jared shot out of a cabin like a Ken doll in a slingshot. <laughs> Which, like, that is so epic. I'm like, oh, they, they, you, you've ordered words in a way that I just I never imagined hearing Ken slingshot and, and whatnot within a book before. So I thought that was really funny. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was like, phew. <laughs> And uh, for those who are going to the Golden Crown Literary Society Conference uh, this this uh, summer, uh, we will have an opportunity to to hopefully shoot some Ken dolls out of slings. So awesome! Tuned. Another reason to go, right? Right, right. Oh, and and this particular one is not funny, but it, it kind of does teenage angst really well. Also, from uh, forgive me if I told you this before, Isabel and I were like bees. When we stung, we died. She was. A yellow jacket, her barb, uh, her barb hand cruel uh, with with a black hook and a sack of poison trembling at its tip. So, like I, I probably felt like the bees because I never was very good at standing up by myself, and whenever I tried it, it just never really worked out. Um, you know, in you know, in, in direct uh, you know, contrast with this uh, goth heroine who's just like, yeah. I'm going to say things to you that are going to crush your soul. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so it's just like, yeah, I really, I really like that. Um, the other thing, this is a quote about Adair, which I thought was kind of cool. She was gorgeous in person beneath her tank top. She had a dancer's body graceful from a distance, but muscular as rebar up close. And I'm like, wow, muscles like rebar. That's, that's deep. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, let's see what else. Actually, this is not a quote, but I, I'm thinking about for good. We haven't really talked that much about that. Um, you know, you have a way with names for things. For example, um, the whiskey that Mary Dale and Aldine end up making together, they their brand is called Sadfire Whiskey, which I thought was just really an epic name for their brand. Thank you. Um, that one I actually came up with all by myself. I do tend to steal 
uh, place names. So, for example, Piddock College from the Admirer, uh, the Piddock family was big in Portland, so there's the Piddock Mansion and all sorts of Piddock stuff. So, um, And in uh, For Good, the mountain range that they uh visit in the first part of the book in Eastern Oregon. It's called the Firesteed Mountains. And it's actually, uh, Firesteed is a winery in our area, so I completely stole that from them. Um, however, Sad Fire Whiskey was my own invention, so I'm, I'm glad you liked it. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's kind of like um, I created in my series that's in the Pioneer Valley, I created uh, a bar called the Crooked Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is funny because we're queer, you know, we, we don't go the straight line. So it's like, right. Yeah, it's right. Just, ah, it's so good. So much like subtle metaphor in there. <laughs> yeah. The crooked arrow. I love it. No, but it's, it, those are, those are little fun, um, gems. So as we're drawing to a close, um, I pose this question off air so that you, you know, I wouldn't take you unawares. But if you could look at your body of work, do you feel that there's a vein or a theme or something that connects them all, even though we we have young adult, we have romance, and we also have thriller in there? If I got to answer the question simply for the thrillers and the romance novels, I think I would probably have more concrete things to say. The, uh, the young adult novel started as a memoir and it failed to, failed to be published because it was, my life is not that interesting is actually the answer to that question. Uh, but when I rewrote it as a novel, amplifying themes and elements and events and stories of people. So basically, forgive me if I've told you this before, is my life if I had actually been cool. Uh, so so uh, that story stands out in many ways from the rest of what I've written and probably for the rest of what I will write for the foreseeable future. I feel like I will write another literary novel like that one again at some point. Um, but right now I don't know that I have the literary content that I want to share. I don't have a message the way I did when I wrote, forgive me if I've told you this before. Um, but even given that, that that one kind of stands out uh, from my other work, the thing that I really aim to create is literary quality pleasure reading. Um, as an English professor and just as a general, I guess, snob, uh, sadly, but true. Uh, I find it hard to find books to read for fun. There are lots of thoughtful, serious literary novels that meet my criteria for good writing. And there are a lot of genre novels in romance and thriller that have storylines that would uh, that attract me, but the writing to my taste is kind of flat. And and that's okay because those writers are writing in the style of their genre. And I'm talking now about big mainstream New York Times bestsellers, um, people who are making more money in a month than I will in a year as a writer, um, you know, real big names. But still, the writing has a kind of um, straightforwardness about it that I don't love. And so I'm always looking for this perfect blend of literary quality with a good old-fashioned romance story or a good old-fashioned thriller story. And that, I think, is what I have created and what I hope stands out in the audience I'm thinking of when I'm writing my books is that person who really just wants to lose themselves in a good book at the side of the pool or at the campsite or wherever they go to relax, um, but still has a kind of expectation for a certain level of literary quality. Not to say in any ways that I'm the next Hemingway, but um, I think that my readers will find the stories pay a little bit more attention to the craft of language than a lot of genre fiction does, a little bit more attention to kind of a veracity, a truthfulness of human experience than a lot of romance might. Um, so I say that I write uh, slutty novels for English majors. <laughs> oh, but you have one more claim to fame, which, you know, tickles me because you're all, you're all famous and stuff. 
On the cover of Forgive Me If I've Told You This Before, there is a pull quote um, from a review. I absolutely love this book from Sarah Quinn of Tegan and Sarah, who are musicians. <laughs> Like, how much more cool could you stamp on top of that? You you write um, a fictionalized memoir where you're the cool kid, and then you have cool kids saying, hey, you're cool. <laughs> it, I, was, I, was, I was pretty delighted um, by that. And uh, subsequently, every time Sarah, Tegan and Sarah have played Portland, they've um, given us, me and my wife, uh, free tickets to the concert, and we've gone backstage with them afterwards and they've let us eat donuts and drink beer with them uh, post-concert. So uh, that's, I'm just incredibly flattered by that review and, and by that friendship. They're really amazing uh, musicians and people and just as nice and cool and down to earth and, and committed to the, you know, improving the world for everyone. Just as they are just as awesome backstage as you think they are following their social media or listening to their music they really are as cool in person uh, as they as they seem to be that's so rad yeah it makes me think of a different uh experience i'm gonna close out the interview <laughs> it's all about me um when i was in college you and i were in college at the same time uh went 16 miles down the road but we didn't know each other um I remember how it was nearly obligatory as a feminist or um, as a lesbian, bisexual, that you had to love certain musicians. And for that reason, I had to not love them. And that would include the Insco Girls and um, uh, Ani DeFranco and Sarah McLaughlin and whatnot. And I've made my peace with Sarah McLaughlin because a, a girl that I had a huge crush on uh, my senior year. She uh, she sang Building a Mystery, uh, mystery in, uh, in a acapella band and I was <sighs> taken away um, but I was given a ticket to Ani DeFranco and I didn't want to go but because it was free and somebody was making me go I'm like <sighs> fine and I saw her live and I completely fell in love with this you know it was this juxtaposition of strength frailty weakness power you know shyness um, boldness that she had and it was not just the music itself, it, it, as is common with um, musicians, especially folk musicians, there's lots of kind of chit chat between songs, and I and that's how I was won over. And I think that who she seems on stage would, to me, be more likely to be true to who she is rather than um, a glossy, you know, shiny uh, penny online and not so much so in person. So I'm sure that. Um, my listeners are happy to learn that you are a cool cat as, as a 40 year old woman. <laughs> and, I finally yeah. made it. You made it. You made I'm it, girl. I'm cool now. You're cool. It's not just, you know, that's just finally, you know, that's why I, uh, you're. I, I tease my wife that, you know, it's, it's been 18 years and she still hasn't noticed that I'm not actually cool, but uh, she, she's, she always, speaks to the contrary. I know, and you've married her about six or seven times, and I'm not being sarcastic. You actually had a lot of commitment ceremonies. But I think, you know, as as in closing, interestingly enough, I'm going to use your dedication from Forgive Me If I've Told You This Before, which is for queer kids everywhere, hang in there. And if you're, as you self-proclaimed, not cool kid self, uh, can grow up and then eventually magically in you know your late 30s turn into the cool cat you always thought you deserved to be then yeah the whole it gets better is it, it, it maintains veracity in this case does indeed <laughs> thank you so much for being my second guest it's always such a pleasure to spend time with you and to talk fiction thank you so much liz it's always wonderful to talk to you